So, good morning everyone. Welcome to Brownforsk and this uh, result webinar. Uh, we will get a presentation of the results from the project Studies on Environmentally Friendly Flame Retardants for Cellulose-Based Materials by Anna-Karin Larsson and Anitam Patra from Lulio University of Technology. Now, um, they will present themselves in a while when they start the presentation. Now, a few words about Brownforsk before we start. Um, we have a vision, a fire-safe society built on knowledge. We develop and communicate knowledge, and mostly research, and that is to limit the negative consequences of fire in the society. We started in 1979, and since last year we are a foundation. We have supporting organizations that fund everything that we do, and this makes us a collaboration between many parts of the society, and the funding so far this year is about 600,000 euro. We spend the money on research, of course, and a lot of result communication like this one. We also have a research school for practicing fire safety engineers in fire services, and that makes them part-time PhD students. And we have scholarships for students. Now, this is a list of our supporting organizations, and it's uh, really thanks to them that we can do this. And as I mentioned, we have so far uh, raised about 600,000 euro. Now the program for today, um, I'm begin beginning to feel ready with the introduction so that we can get to the presentation of the results. And after that, we that will be time for questions and discussions with the researchers. And please answer our polls while uh, waiting for the presentation that will start in uh, just a minute. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you for inviting us to have this webinar presentation of our research project from Brandforsk. We have been studying an environmentally friendly flame retardants for cellulose-based materials. And I'm Anna-Karin Larsson and I work as an associate professor at Chemistry of Interfaces at Luleå University of Technology. And I am Onutam Patra. I work as a researcher in the same research group. Yep. And we have uh, some people that we want to acknowledge. First of all, Brandforsk, who gave us the money so we can do this investigation. And the project panel group has been Anders Lundberg from MSB, Matthias Delin from Brandforsk, and Robert Johnson McNamee from Brandschutzlaget, who have been giving many positive suggestions for our project. And we also want to thank our fire engineering students who have uh, done their master and bachelor thesis, collecting most of the data we will present. Sara Kjellin, Herman Paulusson, Matthias Ström, Evelina Wikberg and Jessica Wagerland. We have also had some help with our experiments. Tobias Sparman at Umeå University has helped with the NMR measurements. And Alexandra Byström at Luleå University of Technology has helped with the cone calorimeter. So I will start by giving a background to our project. So there are environmental policies and instruments that push for a sustainable society. So there, there is a wish to use renewable resources, non-toxic environment, so natural materials like cellulose-based wood and cotton has become very interesting. And we also know that many housing fires start in loose furnishing. So there are requirements from the authorities to have a fire safe environment, which means using less combustible materials and or flame retardants. But many of the flame retardants that are used today, they are toxic. So if you can replace those toxic flame retardants with non-toxic ones, which are naturally occurring and bio-based, that would be a benefit for sustainability. And many of those flame retardants, when you synthesize them, you need the hazardous solvents and you get hazardous waste. But if we can prepare those flame retardants from just an aqueous solution, and the waste will also be non-toxic, that would be very good. 
So the results that we will present from this project we think will be interesting for the scientific community, companies and organizations working for a fire safe and sustainable living environment. So we will go through a bit about the idea of this project and then we will show some of the results. So our idea was to use phytic acid as a flame retardant. It's a natural source of phosphorus in plants. So you can find it in seeds and grains. So every morning when you have your breakfast, you eat phytic acid. So it mixes with simple minerals and form insoluble metal phytate complexes like magnesium, calcium, iron, etc. So if you look at the figure to the right, you can see that this phytic acid molecule has six phosphate groups and you have hydrogen on those phosphate groups and those hydrogens can be replaced with metal ions to form those insoluble complexes. So we will then try different metal ions and see their flame retardant properties. So when things catch fire, that means that all four sides of a fire tetrahedron is at place. So those are your heat, oxygen, fuel and the chain reaction. So when you heat the material like the cellulose, it produces flammable volatiles. So that's our fuel. And then when they come in contact with oxygen in the air, they will ignite. And this combustion process that starts will then produce heat, which will form more pyrolysis gases and the chain reaction will progress. So with a flame retardant, you can delay or prevent the fire by removing one or several of the sites of this fire tetrahedron. So our aim was to remove all four of them. So if we look then at our project ID, it's then to take this phytic acid and common metal ions that are both non-toxic and abundant. We will form an insoluble surface coating on our material, cotton or wood, by dipping it in an aqueous solution of this phytate mixture. So this insoluble surface coating, which means it's insoluble, so it will be waterproof. It will not dissolve during rain or washing. So the picture there with this layer. So the idea is then that this flame retardant, we can remove the fuel, because when this phytic acid molecule breaks down when it's heated, it will form phosphate groups and phosphoric acid is an acid and acids char the cellulose. So that will lead to a decreased amount of pyrolysis gases, less fuel. And this charring, when it's happening at the lower temperature, it will change the composition of the pyrolysis gases. So they, the ones that form will be less combustible than the normal mixture without the flame retardant. And we also want to remove the oxygen. So this flame retardant layer will hinder the pyrolysis gases from coming into contact with the air and ignite because it cannot penetrate this layer. But when this metal phytate layer decomposes when it's heating, then it, the parts that form, they will form another layer. So the carbon ring in the middle of this phytic acid molecule, they will fuse together into a graphite-like polyaromatic carbon layer, the char. And the phosphate groups that are left and the metal ions, for instance, calcium, they will form an appetite-like structure, one type of calcium phosphate that is the same as we have in our tooth animal. So this will be a very hard barrier, which will then hinder the contact between oxygen and fuel. And depending on how we mix those components of the flame retardant, we can also get non-flammable gases that can form during the decomposition, which can then dilute the oxygen so we don't reach the lower flammability limit. 
We can also remove the heat. There will be some water absorbed in this flame retardant layer that will evaporate and cool the surface. When the water vapor and pyrolysis gases form, they will blow up this char layer and NML, so it will intumesce and swell up. And this can change the heat conductivity properties. And finally, we can remove the chain reaction because those radicals, they are species with unpaired electrons. So that form when bonds break in the pyrolysis process. And those uh, single electrons, they make those radicals very reactive. So that starts the chain reaction where new radicals are formed and the fire progresses. But sodium and phosphorus are known to be radical inhibitors. So they will have the ability to terminate those radical reactions, which will decrease the flammability and slower the progress of the fire. So this was our idea, what we think theoretically, and the project outline then, when we'll do experiments to see if this is uh, according out to the theory or not. Then we have a lot of data from our thesis workers. So we want to systematically analyze them because each of the students have investigated different types of mixtures of flame retardants and metals. So now we want to look at all of these data together and see if we can find some correlations, something interesting in this and perform some complementary measurements that we need. So we will evaluate different conditions, different types of ions, relative concentrations between ions and phytic acid, different pH and other parameters. So we want to describe the flame retardant mechanisms and link the macroscopic fire properties to the molecular properties of the flame retardant. So we will not go into very much details We'll not put out references on every slide from where the information is, but if you read the report, you will get all the details and all the references. Mm -hmm. So I can take over now, and I will discuss about the experimental part of the project. So we prepared the phytic acid solution first, and that is done from commercially available phytic acid, which you can find from most of the commercial, uh, most of the chemical producers, and it comes 50% aqua solution. From there, we have dil diluted to 3% solution and 10% solution. And that's our standard we used for our trial. And in Different cases, we have added different metal ions, especially sodium and calcium. And also, they are in different molar ratio. As you can see here, the sodium 4, calcium 2, and the protons. So we varied their relative ratio in the formulation. After we made the solutions, we dipped our material like cotton, sawdust, or wood pieces. Cotton we have dipped for one minute, then took it out and dried in air for at least one day. And we measured how it's drying. We measured the weight of the sample time to time for six days. And we saw after one day, the sample become quite okay, means it loses its water content. And so increasing drying did not show a big effect in the flame retardant process. The sawdust we dipped in water and stirred with a magnetic starter for 10 minutes and then filtered and dried in air for 24 hours. And wood piece also we dipped in the different solutions. We have also made pure metal phytate complex. In that cases, we used more concentrated solutions like 30% solution and added metal ions in appropriate proportion and start at least half an hour. Then we took it 
then we actually cooled it to liquid nitrogen temperature and freeze dried for two days. And then we get the solid material, water free, and we used it for different analytical experiment and compared with the samples with the wood or cotton plus the flame retardant. However, we found that depends on the pH and sometimes with the concentration, the cotton pieces can become a bit stiff. And if they have color, sometimes the pH can influence their color. The amount of metal fighted from frame retardant is around 10% to 38%, depends on which metal ion we are using and the concentration we are using. So if it is 10% solution, of course, the weight increase is more. With the wood, the, there is no big effect. There is no visible difference. Then one thing, we this project was actually a proof of trial project. So we did not try to control humidity and other factors because it would have taken a lot of time to just prepare the samples. Rather, we tried to make made the sample in a simple, straightforward way and try checked, yes, they indeed have flame retardant behavior. So there is the humidity in the room when we made the sample that varied a bit. So it's difficult for wood samples to tell how exactly how much flame retardant was absorbed. But now we are working on it. I'll describe in later slides how we are controlling the humidity in the follow-up follow project. Next question, when we made the samples, when we made the samples, are they stable? If we put the samples in aqueous solution, for example, if we make a cloth out of it, Will it be there if it is get under rain or if it get washed? To know that we used UV visible spectroscopy. What we did is, as you see in the bottom part, we take ferric chloride solution and added ammonium thiocyanate solution to it. Both are very common reagent in chemistry labs. Then iron forms a deep red color complex which can be easily detected by UV visible spectroscopy and that we have a standard solution we know the concentration of the material there then if we add phytic acid phytic acid is known to bind very strongly with iron so then it will form a complex phytic acid form a stronger complex with iron in a quantitative way so the red color will start disappearing. So as you see on the left, we have higher absorbance when there is no phytic acid added and I am adding more and more phytic acid. So the absorbance is decreasing with increasing amount of phytic acid. We checked that when we have sodium salt of phytic acid, that is as when you make a sample, it becomes 12% 12 of weight of the phytic acid. But if we leach it, nearly half of it we lose because sodium salts are always more soluble. At the similar experiment, when we have the calcium salt of the phytic acid, we found there is no leaching. So that's quite stable on the cloth because we cannot detect any least phytic acid in the solution. Now we go to the actual combustion test. We took our cloth material that we prepared and hanged it from a metal rack and below the cloth we put the flame. The height was six as we wrote six centimeter flame height. The cotton is nine centimeter and we heat it for five minutes. When we put the untreated cotton 
that catch fire and burns completely. But when treated the cotton with flame retardant, the sample chart, but it did not catch fire. I can show you a video. It may be interesting to see. So this is untreated cotton that I'm hanging from the rack. And we have a timer in the right. It caught fired almost immediately in a single try. And it burns with big flame. It's still glowing. Yes. And now we take a phytic acid sample. It's a sodium salt actually of phytic acid. I'm trying to put fire. No, it's only charring. Slowly didn't catch fire. So I try a little more. Yes, again it is growing, but there is no big flame. Now there is a very small flame. So you have seen that phytic acid, the sodium salt, it worked quite nicely as a flame retardant. Below, we have some pieces of different composition. The left one, 3% solution, the left one is just pure phytic acid, no metal ions. And you can see the ones with the sodium, they are actually worked better. The burning is much less and when you go to a 10% then it is extremely low even we heat it for five minutes it didn't burn we also tried to do the combustion test but with cigarettes and that was very interesting project with bank force the cigarette tests so we have similar samples sodium 686 phytic acid, so there are six sodium ions. We, and I want to say that we didn't use any real human smoker. We took a pump. I had an old oil free pump that we used to smoke the cigarette to start the fire and continue it glowing. And I used a stopcock to control the amount of air suction because if I connect it to the pump, it the cigarette burns in few seconds. And you can see there are some yellow things that is a sand. So in between the experiments, I extinguish the fire of the cigarette with just dipping in the sand. So when we take untreated cotton, you can see the cigarette, the red part, it makes a hole within few seconds, but it did did not catch fire. And after longer period, it created a hole in the cloth. When it was the sodium salt or other salt, then, or that rather to say treated sample, it charged, but it did not make a hole. And even in the right bottom, even after a long period, it did really not make a hole. You can see the cigarette is glowing quite big because I put the suction quite high, but the cloth was without a hole inside. Now the combustion test with of the wood. As I mentioned earlier, the amount of flame retardant was a bit difficult to estimate with the wood samples because it has 
the difference in our humidity when we prepared the samples. We took a burner and it was 12 centimeter away from the, no, it is, it is, we have a burner and we had, we took the matchstick and we cut the tip of top of the matchstick. We put the rod and below we put the flame 12 at 12 centimeter distance. So untreated woods catch fire quite fast, but the treated one are much better. So the treated sticks become black after almost one minute and bent after even long time, but they actually did never ignited. Other than sodium and calcium, we used here aluminum and iron and in very low concentration, but still they showed quite interesting effect related to flame retardants. Now we talk about the humidity control because later part we realized we need to control the humidity of the sample in order to understand how what is the exact weight of wood and how much moisture it remains in the wood. So if you see the graph in the left bottom, we took the wood and I kept, we kept in the oven for one hour then and then I made, keep on in, keep, kept, take the weight of the food and it decreased from the original one. But if I keep, kept for longer period, I saw the weight of the wood is not decreasing anymore. So it means that all the moisture leave the wood sample after one hour. Then I took it out and kept in the open air in our lab. And humidity in our lab is around 33%, quite constant, that I have checked. So within the first 10 minutes, you can see the weight of the wood increases quite fast. So almost 15% weight increases. And then I kept it for almost one whole day. And weight did not increase anymore. And I can do this cycle several times. I put the, the wood back in the oven at 100 degree, within one hour it dropped 15% and I take it out within 10 minutes it goes back. So that showed us the amount of humid, the remaining residual moisture in the wood. In another test, we dried the wood samples, but now we made a humidity chamber and it's quite easy to construct. We took a glass, chamber, a 5 liter chamber where we can pour cover with a, another glass and inside the chamber we kept a saturated salt solution of different salt like sodium nitrate, uh, magnesium nitrate or magnesium chloride and if we keep cover the glass now the glass chamber the humidity remains quite constant. And it is a very efficient method to controlling humidity. So now the dried wood we kept at different humidity chamber, the humidity condition, and you can see humidity slowly increases. And it can even increase 35% when we keep 100% relative humidity, which you can achieve by keeping just plain water inside the chamber. So those are our basic understanding when we prepare sample in the future, how much moisture content it, it originally had. Because now what happened, now I can tell you, when we take the, say, one gram wood, dust, sawdust, then we treat it with flame retardant solution. For, we start for 10 minutes, filtered and dried. When we test it, we see there is flame retardant effect. It means they absorb the flame retardant, but their weight become less than one gram. So it was a bit confusing at the beginning what happens. Later we realized that all wood samples have some soluble salt or soluble minerals. When we put them in solution, then part of it 
dissolves in water. And that also is measured how much we can lose. So in the future, we can use all these variables to understand exactly what is the weight of the actual wood in our sample. So we can quantify the amount of flame retardant in the sample. Now we do the analytical methods. We start with thermogrammetric analysis. The flame retardants, their action is they decomposes and they start the charring process as Anagarin described earlier at lower temperature than untreated sample. And that actually leads to formation of less combustible pyrolysis gases. And it also hinders complete decomposition of cellulose, as you've seen in my videos, that the cotton did not disappear completely in case of treated samples. In the graph, you can see the water is actually around 100 degrees. There is a little weight loss. It is because of the loss of water, loose water. And then if ammonia is also present, they are also lost in the, the blue one. They are lost first. And for the treated samples, there are much more mass left. We haven't seen a bit less for aluminum and iron treated samples, but we use very low concentration. Maybe that is the reason they lost. They, in those cases, weight loss was a bit more. And so far, what we have tested, all the samples we have dipped one time here, multiple dippings we didn't display. And in this slide, we saw the pure samples. So pure flame retardants, they decompose very similarly, both in air and nitrogen. Other than we can show here, you can see we, we are showing both in air atmosphere and nitrogen atmosphere. And pure phytic acid a bit different, they decompose a bit more in the air. We also did DSC, differential scanning calorimetry. There we can see the this green one is the calcium salt. They are actually exothermic, so they are giving heat. While the pure phytic acid is endothermic. And these experiments were done in nitrogen atmosphere. This, the data I showed, we'll try to interpret our results that we get later. We also analyzed our sample with cone calorimetry. We saw that when we take just untreated sample that was burned and disappeared completely in the cone calorimeter. But all the treated samples, as we saw in the burning test, they retained after cone calorimetry experiment. One interesting thing you can see, we have shown three graphs. The first one is called HRR, that is heat release rate over the time. So after 20 seconds, the treated samples, you can see, they started releasing heat, they start getting oxidized. But the untreated one actually resisted fire for longer period. The reason behind the treated pieces ignite earlier. But interesting thing is that the treated things, they actually retain much more mass after the burning. And next one is THR, that is a total heat release rate. And third one is interesting figure. It's, it is the top peak of the HRR and the time, the quotient between the highest peak, peak of the HRR divided by the heat, the, divided by the time. Here we can see only the so sodium salts, they are actually better. The lower the figure, the better is the fire retardant behavior. So the sodium salt with proton is the best in this respect. 
We also treated our samples in the furnace. What we did, we made the pure phytic acid and their metal salts and put them in the furnace, say 200 degree, 300 degree till 1000 degree at 100 degree interval. We prepared the cotton samples and sawdust sample treated with flame retardant and we also treated them in the similar way. Here we are showing the pure samples at 300 degree, 500 degree and 950 degrees. At 950 degree, pure phytic acid volatilized completely or oxidized completely. Around 300, you can see all of the samples, which was grays or light gray, they turned to black. When we go to 500, the sample started swell up more and especially the sodium one, you can see, and it become dark gray or a bit brownish. And above 800 actually, I didn't show the figure here because of the lack of space, the sodium already started becoming white. The pure phytic acid start disappearing almost and cal the calcium one still remain black. At 950, you can see the calcium one has, still has some black, but the sodium, it forms a crystalline phase and that really becomes stuck at the bottom of the heating vessel. The sodium 6 and H4PA and calcium 4 H4PA, they actually swell up because the vapor for, that forms during the decomposition. The samples change color as I described earlier from black to white because the charred carbon part has combusted. So as you go higher and higher temperature, the carbon content is decreasing. So for sodium, the process occur much earlier. And finally, it become a really hard ceramic material. So I cannot take it out easily. So it's, there is still quite a lot remains, the sodium salt. So I have to really crack the heating vessel. And then the part comes out as a nice crystalline material when the ceramic things are formed. Yes, now I give it back to Anakari. Yes, uh, we wanted to investigate our samples then, what has happened with these different temperatures, since we saw from the TDA results that they lose the mass and the pyrolysis starts at different temperatures. But what is happening with the flame retardant? What do we get instead? So when we took those samples from the furnace and then when they had cooled down, we did NMR measurements on them. NMR is nuclear magnetic resonance. So we look at the atoms in the sample, carbon atoms, and later I will show phosphorus atoms. And we have reference compounds with a certain electronic distribution around the carbon and phosphorus atoms. When something happens with the samples, the electronic environment changes, and then the peaks that we detect with radio frequency radiation will shift compared to the rest reference. So the scale on those spectra is in ppm, parts per million shift from the reference compound. So this is uh, what we see when we look at the carbon atoms in the phytic acid. At 200 degrees, the signal that we see comes from the original phytic acid sample, either calcium or sodium atoms. And then when we heat to 300 degrees, we can see that in calcium, we still have a signal at the same chemical shift as it's called around 75 ppm as the original sample. So we still have some calcium phytate left at 300 but sodium, then that peak position is lost. So we don't have any sodium phytate left. Instead, we see two new peaks to the left of the original one. Those peaks tell us that we have started to get some aromatic compound. 
So the flame retardant has broken down, the phosphorus groups have formed phosphoric acid and started to char the cellulose. Here we have only the pure complexes, so we don't have any cellulose, only the phytate. But the phosphate groups are gone, and then those carbon rings, they start to fuse together to form a graphite-like aromatic, polyaromatic char. And when we increase the temperature even more, we see that the signals become weaker, we have more noise, that means that this char disappears, it slowly starts to combust, and at 800 degrees there is nothing left of this carbon part. Mm. If we instead look at the phosphorus atoms in those phytate groups, then we can see at 200 degrees, the peak close to zero there. That's one of the peaks comes from the original phytic acid, and the other peak comes from pyrophosphate. So those phosphate groups in the phytic acid molecule, they have started to break down and then fuse together. So we get two phosph phosphates fused together into a pyrophosphate. And when we increase the temperature to 400 degrees, we can see that for calcium, we still have the original phytate there. We have some pyrophosphate, but we have also started to get higher polymers with more than two fragments binding together in a polyphosphate chain. Sodium is less stable, so here we have nothing left of our sodium phytate. Everything has polymerized into pyrophosphate and polyphosphates. If we increase to 600 degrees, we can see that we get some more crystalline, we get more narrow peaks, it means that the sample has started to crystallize. And at 1000 degrees, the calcium is very, very crystalline. But the sodium mm. sample has melted and then it has lost all its crystallinity when it's condensed again. So those ceramic calcium phosphates that have formed, they are very stable at 1000 degrees. That's what is left on the, from the flame retardant. The carbon part is gone and we have the calcium phosphate or sodium polyphosphate and calcium polyphosphates mm. in the mixture. When we look at carbon nucleus, then we can only look at the pure flame retardants because the cellulose has so much carbon atoms in it that we cannot separate the carbon from the cellulose and the carbon from our flame retardant. But there is no phosphorus in cellulose, so that's the perfect thing with looking at phosphorus, that we can see what is happening with the flame retardant when it is attached to some cellulose material, like sawdust. And now I think you missed one slide with the cotton. Mm -hmm. So here we can see we have treated cotton with calcium and sodium phytates. So at 450 degrees, it has started to polymerize in both cases. And the sodium version is almost completely polymerized mm. at 800. But the calcium has formed the calcium phosphate, mostly those, those sharp narrow peaks around zero, and then the broader peak around minus 25, that's the polyphosphate. So it's a mixture of calcium phosphate and polyphosphates that has formed. And those polymerizations, they are endothermic reactions, so they will take away some of the heat from the fire when they form. But as we saw, the calcium phosphate is more exothermic because it's a very stable compound, so it gives away heat when it forms. So then if we look at the sawdust, then we saw some interesting things. So now you can hear. Then we compared sodium, where we have replaced all of the 12 hydrogens in the phytic acid, and one version where we have replaced only six of them. And then we can see that the peaks shift in completely different directions when we increase the temperature. 
when we have 12 sodium, the peaks start to move to the left. And this tells us that we get the sodium phosphate. We don't get any polymerization at all in this case. But on the other part of the spectrum where we have six sodium and six hydrogen, then the peaks shift to the right instead. And those signals to the right, they tell us that we have a polymerized the sample. And there is just a tiny, tiny fraction of sodium phosphate. So in principle, all of the phytate has polymerized into polyphosphates. So we need hydrogens there to get this polymerization reaction going. So if we then continue to the conclusions and try to summarize this, we can see that we have used different analytical methods and the results that we get from them agree with each other so we can use them to explain the same things. And we can see the macroscopic fire properties can be linked to the molecular properties. Sodium is a good flame retardant because we could see that it forms those polymers that take heat away. But the problem with sodium phytate is that it's water soluble. So we want to have a material that is not water soluble and that is calcium phytate. But it was not as good as a flame retardant because of this exothermic decomposition into stable calcium phosphates. And we can see that when we have these acidic protons available in the structure, then we have better flame retardancy because then we have better ability to char the wood. Aluminium and iron phytates, we had only a tiny amount of aluminium and iron, but we still had flame retardant properties. We can see that the cotton samples self-extinguish rather than burn like the untreated ones. And the flame retarding mechanisms seem to attack all four sides of the fire tetrahedron as we have predicted. We see that the phytic acid decompose gets phosphoric acid which chars the surface, reduce the volatiles and their flammability. We can see that the graphite-like char is formed. We can see that it polymerizes into polyphosphates and we can see that it forms very hard ceramic-like calcium and sodium phosphates on the surface. So those will work as a protective barrier then, preventing the contact with the air. When the water evaporates and when the phosphate fragments polymerize, that is both endothermic reactions that will cool the fire. And what we could see was that when we have those pure metal phytate complexes and heat them, they will intumesce. But we could not see this effect on the samples of cotton and wood because we had such a thin layer of flame retardant. And we haven't done any evaluation of the thermal properties on this material. The methods we used cannot tell whether we have a radical quenching mechanism or not, but theory says that there should be one. And we could see that sodium gives a better result than the other compositions, which may be because sodium has a radical quenching effect. So that was what we had to present to you. So now we are ready for your questions. Thank you, Anna, Karin, Anitam. And uh, now uh, the first question is: uh, There appears to be a lot of parameters, parameter variation in the experiments, both with a small flame ignition and cigarette ignition. Did you consider repeatability and reproduci reproducibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, who wants to answer you? Anna, Tamar, yeah, you can. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What up? Uh, yeah. When it comes to cotton, we did a lot of re reproducive results, and it seemed to be quite stable behavior from the cotton. But from the wood, we had all these problems with the humidity and the dissolved minerals. So that's why we decided to not investigate the wood in such detail from the beginning. So instead we focused more on the cotton to make sure that the results is reliable. 
And when it comes to the cigarette, that was just a trial for fun to see how it will work because we didn't follow any standard procedures or anything. We just wanted to see if there is an effect with the cigarette and that we could see, even if it of course is a bit difference between how big flame we had on the cigarette, but we did a lot of burnings and we got more or less the same results every time. Okay, thank you. Um, and now we have another question here. Which type of wood did you use? That also was different. It was spruce and uh, what's the other English name? <laughs> Pine, I think it was. So, but it, um, the big wood pieces was some spruce, but those we didn't continue with because of these problems with the humidity. So then we instead went for sawdust, and that was also spruce. And the matchsticks that we used was the other material, which I don't remember the name of now. But yeah, so you had both soft wood and hard wood yeah. in your tests. First, we saw that, okay, it starts to ignite earlier than the untreated cotton. That is not something that you would think is a good thing. But on the other hand, our samples self-extinguish compared to the untreated cotton, which just continued to burn. So the figure showed it a bit better effect on the sodium, but for the calcium, it was more heat released in total, but we'll, this was also just very quick tests. So we will continue evaluate those results. Yes, right. And we had another question that's, uh, do you plan to do large scale testing in the future? That's our hope that we can continue with this research and scale it up from now we started on the lab scale since we are chemists. But then we hope to get more involved with companies and other organizations that work with bigger samples. Mm. So we know that- That's the idea. Yeah, that the effect <laughs> is, is the same when we scale it up. Yes. Have you been thinking about, uh, that's my own thought, have you been thinking about how to, to, how to apply this to large pieces of wood, for example? Uh, so as we did now with those small pieces, we just had our aqueous solution with those phytic acid and the metal ions, and then we dipped them in this. And of course you can make a bigger vessel where you have this solution and just dip the wood and I, I, we haven't tried any other methods like if we impregnate the wood or but it should be possible to press this solution inside the pores and fibers yes very good so more questions from the attendees uh, very interesting it would also be great to see how different heat loads would affect this. Uh, the Frick Research Center in Norway has a project on fire safe sustainable furniture. Uh, collaboration would be good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sounds good. We are uh, open for collaborations. That's what we want as well. <laughs> excellent. Um, and here's another question. Um, have you conducted a literature study um, of, uh, of the of other ongoing research concerning phytic acid? Uh, yes, we have um, some references that we have included in our report. So it has been when I first got this idea was uh, like ten years ago when we was when I met phytic acid in another context. And by that time, there was nothing published on phytic acid as a flame retardant. So I thought, okay, is that good or bad? But then I didn't have time to continue with this project until now. So after that, a lot of research has been done on phytic acid as a flame retardant. But 
but uh, not so far. There are still many gaps to fill. So, but metal ions to use and other things. So, and right. those studies have been made mixing phytic acid and other types of flame retardants. But we have wanted to study as the pure systems and try to understand it chemically so we can then go further on a scientific basis, think what can we add, what will be better. So we have another approach in those publications. Right. Yeah, yeah you, the you last part much... is the most important, actually, Matthias. The understanding it chemically that yes. I really missed in the literature, though it's really a chemistry. So that's what me and Anakarin want to target. And right. also, no one really did an NMR to understand an FTIR, what chemically happening during the process. Very good. I think you actually yeah. answered the next question, and that's what's next. And uh, yeah. I think you answered that. Yes. Yeah, we have a long list of ideas. So it's just a matter of what to choose. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. And very good. If, as we said, if someone is interested in collaborating, we are very happy to do that. And that can also be something that shifts which way we should go. Where can we find mm. money and where can we find collaborations? And permutation and combination. There are so much things we can do, yeah. even varying ions and material. So there is a lot things we can do, but it also depends on what collaborators and brand force likes to do. We can make a proper plan. Yeah, yeah. Very exciting, I think. Uh, and we have a question here. Uh, if someone wants to collaborate, uh, how should they get in contact with you? Yeah, I can send my email here in the chat. <laughs> oh, yes, excellent. ACLA at LTU.se. Mm. Yes, and we can also make sure that, uh, I mean, uh, your report uh, is already published on the on our website, and mm. I think your contact information is in the report as well. Mm. So, right. And here's a, here's a thank you for Margaret McNamee. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for your interest in watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It's been an exciting project since this was our first introduction into the fire field. So we have learned a lot from this project ourselves mm. and all our students who have gathered data. Yeah, I think it's 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 been very interesting to follow the project and and it's not very often that we have projects at Brandfort that really go so deep into into the chemistry. So I think that's very interesting. So it's very good for the future. And also, Rangni from um, from uh, Frick is saying very interesting. Thank you. Thank you again, Anna Karin and uh, Anitam. Uh, very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you in the in the audience for all the good questions and comments. And if you want to um, attend more Brown Fork webinars, you can find them at our website uh, or by following us on LinkedIn. You can uh, also get um, knowledge about our webinars. You can also register to our newsletter and you will find that at the bottom uh, of our website. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel where you can find earlier webinars and uh, recorded seminars. And if you don't know Swedish yet, uh, this may be the time to start. You know, Seminaria means seminars and uh, that's where you also find our webinars. And Nyhetsbrev, that's newsletter and LinkedIn, that's LinkedIn. And we are working on, a, on an English web page uh, and we'll get a, um, up rolling in the near future, I hope. Um, before we close, I'd like, uh, also like to thank uh, my colleagues, Francis Eurenius and Matthias Hamarin that have mm -hmm. been producing this webinar. Thank you, Francis and Matthias. And you will all get a questionnaire tomorrow and please uh, answer that if that's very valuable for us. And I hope to see you again next week on our webinars. And we actually have two webinars next uh, Tuesday and they will both be in English. So thank you very much and bye-bye, um, stay safe. <laughs>